I'm Prashant. I'm an engineer uh, working on infrastructure at Uber. I specifically work on network infrastructure, so supporting RPCs. We have a pretty extreme microservice architecture at Uber, and so there's a whole bunch of services communicating with each other. And so we, I kind of uh, tech lead for uh, the team that owns the service discovery components and a lot of the routing components. So today, I'm going to talk about how we can use PProf and flame graphs to analyze production. And I don't just mean performance regressions. I mean how you can also find bugs using PProf and flame graphs. But before we can cover flame graphs, let's first talk about PProf. Go comes with pretty powerful profiling built right into it called PProf. PProf supports a whole heap of different profiles. A lot of people are familiar with the CPU profiling, which is basically about 100 times a second. It looks at what's running on the CPU, what the stack trace is for what was running, and records that. That's basically stack sampling. That's the, that tells you what, where your time is being spent. There's also heap profiles, where Go is constantly, uh, well, not constantly, on a fraction of memory allocations, it's recording the stack trace of where that memory was allocated. And PProf lets you view roughly where is, what memory am I currently using. Or you can even look at what memory has been allocated since the startup of this program. You can actually control the rate of allocations as well. I think by default, it's, it tries to do at least one uh, allocation per 512 kilobytes or something, but you can control that using runtime.memprofile rate. There's Go routine profiles, which basically tells you every Go routine that's running in your program and the exact stack trace. You can actually even look at arguments that were passed on the stack, or at least the first five or six arguments passed on the stack in the Go routine profiles, and we'll have a look at that later. There's also tracing, which uh, Frances kind of mentioned earlier. Traces record a bunch of uh, important runtime events. For example, a garbage collection was started. A garbage collection has entered Stop the World. We did a memory allocation, a syscall. All of these are recorded in traces, and you can view a timeline of exactly what happened when. So you can use PProf to profile code during development, whether it's, during your, whether it's with your unit tests or with any benchmarks you've written in your code. But the biggest advantage to PProf personally is uh, that you can run these profiles against production. So I'm going to do a really quick demo of PProf just to show you how PProf works. So we have some code. Don't worry too much about the exact thing I'm profiling. I want to show you the PProf interface and how you can use it. So I'm going to cover the simple case where you want to profile some benchmark that you have, uh, just a basic benchmark you've written. You run that using go test. I'm going to do read headers. Normally, when you run your benchmark, you just get a number which represents how much time was spent uh, inside of that function. If you want to profile this, just pass an extra flag. CPU profile, prof.cpu. Now Go is profiling uh, that benchmark run, and it's going to create a file called prof.cpu, which has information about what was happening inside uh, during this benchmark run. So if we want to look at the data, we want to analyze this data, we run go to a pprof. You have to pass the binary uh, that actually, uh, sorry, so go creates a binary when you run a benchmark with dash CPU profile, and that's mostly for symbols. So it's information about at what memory location is what symbol, et cetera. So we're going to run with that binary, and we're going to pass the profiling data. And now we have the pprof interface. The most basic command is top. So top, you can pass a number like 1, 10, 5, whatever. I tend to do top 10. Top 10 shows you the top functions in terms of uh, CPU usage. But this is just time inside of the function, not any other functions at code. If you want the cumulative time inside of that function or anything else at code, you do top 10 dash cumulative or dash cum. Now I'm going to do that again just so we can see it a little bit clearer. Let's do top five. So you can see it kind of makes sense if you think about it. I'm running a benchmark. Of course, the cumulative entry point should be my benchmark function, followed by the functions it called. If you want to see what happened inside of benchmark read headers, we can, call, we can use a command called list. So list benchmark read headers. Now we see the source code annotated with profiling information. So we have two columns of information on the left here. This is time spent. Uh, inside of this function without calling any child functions, whereas this second column represents time spent inside of functions called by this line. In this case, because it's a function call, 
there's no time spent here. All of the time was spent inside of that function. So let's have a look at what that function was doing. Similar thing again. Most of the time was spent inside of another function. But you can see that some of the time was spent on a different line as well. So you can kind of see, uh, get some idea of where time is being spent within that function. Let's have a look at the underlying function again. Now we see some more useful information here. We see this might be a little bit surprising, but most of the time in this, uh, in this function was actually spent creating the map. And then we've got, we're reading a couple of strings and setting some things in the map. Turns out the most expensive part was creating the map though. One thing you might notice is I mentioned that the left column was for time spent within this function, whereas the right column is for things that were called. However, if you look at some of these, headers v equals v, uh, sorry, headers k equals v, I'm not actually calling a function. Why is Go telling us that it was spent inside of some function call? We can dig down into what your source, source code compiles into using another command called disasm, which basically brings up the disassembly or Go disassembly, which is a little bit higher level than most uh, underlying architecture assemblers. So we can do disasm, uh, disasm, it also takes a regex for the function to match, so we're gonna pass the same function in. And we see a whole bunch of information now about the actual assembly. And one thing you'll notice is that when I set a map key to some specific value, underneath the hood, go is actually calling a function, which is why we saw the profile data in that way. So don't, don't be too afraid of using disasm. It shows you what the runtime's doing under the hood, and it's actually surprisingly easy to read. Now, I mentioned that you can uh, do other types of profiles. So we did a CPU profile. Let's try a memory profile. Almost as easy. Just type in memprofile instead of CPU profile. Create a separate file. Now you can use goToAPProf the same way. So let's create goToAPProf with the mem. Uh, one thing about memory is there's two different measures. There's a measure of what is still being held on? What hasn't the garbage collector cleared? What references are we still holding on to? Which is really useful in production because you want to see why is my process using 500 megs of RAM? What types am I holding on to in memory? But when you're doing things like benchmarks, typically you don't care about what are you holding on. You want to see how many allocations am I doing per iteration of the benchmark loop. So you can tell Go, I want the allocation. And you have two choices here as well. You can ask for space, so alloc underscore space and it shows you information in terms of megabytes, bytes, etc. Or you can pass alloc underscore objects, which tells you the number of objects you're allocating. Maybe you have one huge object and 100 little objects. Those 100 little objects are going to cost you. It turns out allocations are expensive, whereas one large allocation doesn't actually cost that much. Whereas if you look at the space allocation profile, you won't notice these smaller allocations. They'll just dis they'll kind of blend into the noise. So you can tell Go, I care about the object count. So let's do that. And now it's telling us the number of allocations that happened. Um, so let's look at that read headers function that I showed again. Now it's telling us exactly where we're doing our allocations. Of course, allocating a map, uh, sorry, making a map allocates. Reading strings is allocating just because this is converting some byte slices to strings. And of course, uh, it looks like setting it is sometimes allocating as well. well. You notice that we're not allocating as much when we set as when we allocated the map originally or the amount of strings we're reading. Why is that? Well, first of all, we are profiling a fraction of allocations. So for example, these two, they're likely to be exactly the same in production, but the numbers look a little off because we're profiling some percentage of them, and it just happened to be that the, uh, the the profile rate happened to catch more of the keys than the values. So even though those should have been the same, they look a little different. That usually shows by a factor of like three to four X at most, whereas this is a huge difference, right? Why is this so different? It's because most of the time when I'm setting these keys in my map, I've already given it a hint. Uh, I've given it a hint for how big my map is gonna be. It doesn't need to resize my map, but whether you need a resize or not really depends on what buckets your keys and values happen to fall into. So because of that, you need to, uh, whenever you need to resize, you end up uh, creating an extra allocation. So this is the kind of information that's really useful to see from a heap profile. Now, I mentioned that you can also profile a running binary. So how do we do that? Well, first, I'm gonna show you what you need to do to a binary to make it profile, uh, so you can profile it during runtime. It's really, really simple. 
just add this blank import for net HTTP pprof. And I'm right now just uh, listening and serving on the default serve mods. By importing, by blank importing this uh, net HTTP pprof package, you are registering the pprof, pprof handlers on the default serve marks. So if you're using the default serve marks, that's all you need to do. So I've already got the program running. I'm just going to start some sort of benchmark because if you don't have any load, the profiling output is just empty. There's nothing running, right? So let's create some artificial load. And now we want to see what does our pprof page look like? We can just go to debug slash pprof. This is the default path where nethv pprof puts um, the endpoints. You see a bunch of different useful information, like go routines. You can just click go routine, and it's telling us that we have 21 go routines that have the stack trace. And the stack trace is basically for every connection, TCP connection, the HP library is reading from that TCP connection. So we roughly have 21 TCP connections going into this process right now. Uh, there's also heap, which is a little hard for us to read without using go to a pprof. So how could we use go to a pprof to uh, look at this data? It's pretty simple. Go to a pprof and you just pass the URL. And now all of a sudden, we are profiling our production service and getting a heap profile for what's going on. Turns out there's not much that is being referenced by this program, so it could be that my benchmark has ended. Let me just start that again. But we can also say I care about allocated objects because there should be a lot of allocated objects. And there we go. There's a whole bunch of different objects. And you'll notice that I'm looking at a view that isn't the command line interface we were looking at earlier. I used a command called web to show, to create that where pprof generates an SVG and it tells you kind of the hot part. So you can see like, oh, you're allocating a bunch of different objects from this function here. And it shows you kind of the path taken before you allocated the object. Now let's go back to our slides for a little bit. So we kind of saw the visualizations of pprof data. Frances mentioned 1.9 came with some improvements to pprof. You can see before 1.9, this is what our data looked like. Just monochrome, pretty hard to follow actually. There was some differences in the sizes of boxes, but it was hard to see what exactly was going on. 1.9 adds color, which makes it a lot easier to see what are the hot parts? Where am I allocating a ton of objects? But even, even with all of this uh, colored output, there's a lot of data here, especially with a more complex pro program. You're going to have hundreds or thousands of functions allocating, and it can be hard to process all of this data. And that's where flame graphs come in. So flame graphs are a visualization of profiling data that Brendan Gregg, who now works at Netflix, I think still, uh, kind of came up with in around, I think it was around 2011. So flame graphs are a much easier and faster way to comprehend this profiling data. Instead of digging through this really complex graph with a large number of nodes, you can see at a quick glance, where is my time being spent? So let me open this flame graph and make it a little bigger so we can kind of see what's going on. So very quickly, I can see, hey, my reads and my writes, you can tell what proportion of the total time they're taking up immediately. Right? You didn't have to follow the graph. You didn't have to read percentages. You can just visually see Oh, it turns out writes are a little bit slower than reads, right? Now, in this flame graph, y-axis shows the stack depth. So this is the leaf function call, and this was the stack trace leading up to that function call. Uh, the x-axis, the, on the x-axis, the position actually doesn't mean anything, which is a huge point of confusion for a lot of users because they think the x-axis represents time. That is not the case with flame graphs. The x-axis is just alphabetically ordered. There's nothing special about it. What is important, though, is the width. So the fact that this box is not as wide as this box tells us something. The width represents how long that function spent on the CPU. So this box is, uh, is wider, which means that it spent more time on the CPU. right? Um, this doesn't just mean that a function ran for a really long time. It could mean that the function ran for a really long time, but it could mean that you're calling that function a lot of times, and so it happens to be on your CPU a lot of the time. Now, one of the other big advantages of flame graphs is that you can zoom in. So this read and write, maybe I can't really do much about it. I want to debug some specific part of my program. I want to see what is the performance like inside of some handler. Maybe there's something else. I can click in 
and zoom in. So now that read-write noise is kind of just moved away. I don't need to worry about the garbage collector. And I can focus on inside of my handler what's happening. And similarly, you can keep zooming in until you find the information you're looking for. So that, that's a kind of flame graph in a nutshell. The other question I get is, what do these colors mean? Contrary to what you might expect, the colors don't actually mean anything. They're basically random, but they're chosen to be yellow and red and orange, so it looks like a fire, hence the name flame graphs. So let's generate, oh, I didn't mean to close that. Let's generate a flame graph for the same data we, just, we were profiling earlier. So let's start our same benchmark. How do we generate a flame graph? Well, this was the argument, these, this was the command line we used to open a pprof session. Almost exactly the same, just replace go to a pprof with go dash torch. That's it. Nothing else you have to do, it creates a SVG. You can open that SVG, and there you go. We've created a profile for our HTTP server that was running, and now you can very quickly see, oh, I don't really care about this read request. This is stuff in the HTTP library. I can't really optimize what the HP library is doing to read a request. I care about my handler. Let's zoom into my handler. Within my handler, I can see very clearly there's three big things I'm doing. Regex, encoding JSON, and uh, converting time to a string. So if I was to optimize, I would pick the widest bar, regex. Looks like there's a compile here. We're not using compiled regexes. Let's pre-compile our regexes rather than compiling them on every single request. right? It's very easy to kind of see what's going on with flame graphs and zoom in very quickly. So flame graphs can be really useful to uh, analyze any performance issues you're having, whether it's CPU, whether it's memory. But there's other, factors, uh, there's other things you can do with flame graphs. They're actually really useful to debug other issues in production. So I'll go through a few examples where I've used flame graphs and pprof to debug things like memory leaks, GoRoutine spikes, and even deadlocks. So one thing we do in production at Uber is we've enabled the pprof endpoints by default in our RPC frameworks. So almost every service has pprof by default. This is because there's no overhead to registering these handlers. You only pay a cost when you hit the profiling endpoint. Until you hit it, it's free. So why not register them? Because then when you have an issue, you know where to go looking for, for more data. To make it easier for developers, we also have some tooling so you can basically we SSH into production, port forward some things, so that you can run pprof, gotorch, whatever it is, on your local laptop. Because that's what all the tools kind of assume. When you run, run web, it assumes, oh, I'm just going to open a browser on your local machine. So to make it easier, we just uh, forward all of these ports to the developer laptops using a little tool. So let's talk about some of the issues that we've kind of seen in production. Uh, recently, a service owner, uh, sorry, before I kind of cover memory leaks, I want to first mention that memory leaks can happen even in a garbage collected language. People are sometimes surprised when I say memory leak in Go, they're like, wait, but you don't have to free your memory, that's what the garbage collector does. How can you have a memory leak in Go? The memory leaks still happen in garbage collected languages because you can hold on to a reference for longer than you intend to. You may have a list or a slice somewhere that's global, that's keeping track of every request you, uh, you received. Because you're holding on to that reference, now you have a memory leak. Over time, you're using more and more memory, and your server's going to slow down. So recently, a service owner uh, reached out asking for help in debugging a Go memory leak. Easiest thing I typically do when people ask me to debug a memory leak is take a heap snapshot before you restart the service. So while you still have the memory leak, restart it. Now we have a fresh instance, throw a few requests at it to warm it up, compare the different heap snapshots to see where, what are we leaking, right? What is normal? What is supposed to be there because you cached it? What are some objects that you always create on startup? And what is actually the memory leak? Easiest way is just to compare the difference between pre-restart and post-restart. So I did that in this case. We took the snapshots and we looked at the web view. Now, it's possible to figure out what the memory leak is using these two graphs. The problem is there's a lot of data here, and it's going to take a little while. You have to put some effort into reading, oh, what are the numbers? What are the kind of expensive things? What can I ignore? So you can throw that information instead at a flame, into a flame graph using GoTorch. And this is what it looked like. So, sorry, let me make it larger so everyone can see. 
So this is the same comparison, exactly the same profile, except with a flame graph. You can see very clearly that there's something going on down here, right? That is not here in the other graph. And it turns out that was actually the issue. What exactly does that say? It says runtime.systemstack. You're probably thinking, what is a runtime.systemstack and how did this end up in my profile? So after a little bit of digging and I saw references to defer proc in the code and then I looked through the runtime, turns out this happens when you defer, when you defer some work and there's not enough stack space, it uses the system stack or there's something about how it uses the system stacks when you do a defer. So I knew I was looking for something related to defers. Next step, I used the pprof uh, slash debug slash pprof slash goroutines page, and I could see every goroutine running in this service. And the goroutine has a stack trace that has the exact file and line information about where it's running. Using that, I was able to quickly find what goroutines are running, trace them to the code, and I saw some code that looked a little like this. Now, it's probably kind of obvious to some people, but basically someone, is, uh, someone tried to use a defer here, basically to recover from panics because this is a long running service and they didn't want you know, one little bug to crash the service. They used a defer, but they used it in a for loop. Defers don't run at the end of for loops. They run at the end of a function. This function is not expected to end during the lifetime of a service. So what ends up happening? We end up piling on defers onto, our, and onto the stack or in memory in general, and these defers are never actually run. And that's what ended up causing the memory leak in this case. The, defer, this, the surprising thing about this was that even after a few days of running, the service was still only consuming about 300 or 400 megabytes. So it wasn't a huge amount. It was a very slow memory leak that would have been hard to kind of find out. But thanks to the pprof pages and, my flame, and the flame graphs, it was surprisingly easy. And this ended up saving the service owner uh, a bunch of errors because once they got into this state, they were serving requests a little slower than before. They're a service which has a very low timeout, so now all of a sudden, 1% of their requests were failing. All it took was moving the defer one line out, no more issues, no more restarts just to fix a memory leak. So another kind of issue I've dealt with is goroutine leaks. Uh, we typically report a bunch of runtime metrics from our processors in production so that we can trace, uh, oh, this deploy is doing something odd or memory spiked. So we report a whole bunch of Go-specific information, such as what is the heap usage according to Go. We get that from the runtime.read memstats. We also report the number of Go routines. And in one case, we saw a huge spike in the number of Go routines. So again, using a flame graph, we're very quickly able to see what these Go routines were doing. We could look at this and say, oh, these two, these are actually related to reading and writing. So you can kind of see uh, read here, and this one's actually for writing, but those are expected because every TCP connection, we need one Go routine to read and one Go routine to write. So we knew these were kind of expected. This was the surprising, uh, this was the surprising kind of leak. So we looked into what was happening here, and you can kind of see there's a runtime.chan send, which is what this Go routine's doing. What does that mean? It means that a Go routine was blocked on writing to a channel. Turns out this, is, this was supposed to be an asynchronous endpoint where it took some request data, it put the request into a channel, responded immediately, and there was a background Go routine that was processing this work. What happened was that the background Go routine slowed down a huge amount because the downstream service it used to process the data was having a bunch of timeouts. It slowed down, there was timeouts, we were seeing a whole bunch of errors, and because we retry it until a certain timeout, it slowed down processing a huge amount and put a ton of back pressure on the channel the channel was full, and now we were blocking a whole bunch of Go routines on this channel. So the fix was surprisingly easy. It was just return an error if the channel was full. Don't write to a channel without checking whether it's full first, especially in an asynchronous context. And thanks to pprof, this was just as easy to detect as well. Just hit, um, you can either use a flame graph or you can just go to slash debug slash Go routines. Go routines page gives you all of this information as well. Now, once we got rid of this bad, uh, we got rid of the bad downstream service that was timing out, we expected all of these Go routines to clear up because now we're processing all of the backlog and this should have emptied out. Now we should have no more issues, right? Well, turns out that we were using this number here, it's from PS and it's the memory usage, was over 100 gigabytes. 
And at this point, there was nothing in our GoRoutine logs. Everything was looking good. GoRoutines were back to normal. Why was this still using that uh, huge amount of memory? So we went through pprof. You quickly see some interesting things here. You're like runtime.malg. Not something I'm used to seeing. What's going on here? Do a few Googles. Find, uh, this is some memory related to a GoRoutine. So while we were kind of backlogged, we had up to, I think, a million GoRoutines running. Right? And even though all of those GoRoutines have been drained, they weren't running anymore, GoRoutine, there's some memory related to GoRoutines that is never freed in the runtime. And so because of that, we're always going to hold on to that memory. But 100 gigabytes is a huge amount of memory. GoRoutines are supposed to use a tiny amount of memory, like 3 kilobytes each. What happened here? Turns out there's a known issue where when you're allocating a whole bunch of GoRoutines, the GoRoutine descriptor can leave your heap in a fragmented state. So as you do more memory allocations, they can't use the free memory that's available because of how it's left, uh, the, how, how it just leaves holes. And so we ended up with a huge amount of fragmentation and using 100 gigs of RAM. In this case, unfortunately, we didn't really have many choices. We just restarted the process and took care of it. So pprof can also help you find deadlocks. Now, a common deadlock that, uh, the most common way to run into deadlocks is misuse of some of the locking structures, like whether it's sync mutex or sync.rw mutex. We had a, a slightly more subtle deadlock in one case where we accidentally were getting a read lock and then getting the same read lock in a separate function. We didn't realize this was happening, of course, because most of the time it, looks, it works out fine. The only scenario in which you see an error is if someone tries to get a write lock in between your first read lock and the second read lock. That doesn't happen very frequently. But it happens. And when it happens, all of your GoRoutines are deadlocked. So we detected, uh, again, we could see that there was a large spike in GoRoutines, memory usage, because something was deadlocked and things weren't being processed. So now I use the uh, GoRoutines, except you'll notice there's debug equals 2. What is this debug equals 2? Well, when you look at the GoRoutines page, there's actually two different versions of it. One does a whole bunch of aggregation for you. So this is saying there's 33 GoRoutines with this exact stack, or 33 GoRoutines with this exact stack. Right? It's aggregated some information about them for you. Two, on the other hand, gives you information about every individual GoRoutine. Now, one of the most useful things is that it also tells you exactly how long a GoRoutine has been in some sort of block state. So here, we were able to see there's a semi-acquire, which means we're trying to acquire some semaphore, which is typically what happens on a lock. Um, in this case, this isn't actually such a bad thing. This, this one here was something waiting to close. That's OK. But you'll see that the read locks were also in this semi-acquire stage. So using this, we're able to find out what is the stack trace that led to this? How did we end up locking the same, same thing twice? Trace through the stack trace. And of course, fixing it was super easy. It was a one-line change where instead of calling a function which gets the read lock for you, this was supposed to be a helper function that gets the read lock and returns the information. We just access the, uh, the map directly. One other example I want to uh, cover with um, how pprof has helped us debug kind of production issues is a very tricky uh, memory leak that I ran into recently. So we have a forwarding proxy where you send your request to the proxy, the proxy uh, sends it to the destination. So a ton of requests are going through this proxy. This proxy is everywhere. And we suddenly saw that there was about five or six different instances using a ton of memory. This thing usually uses less than a few hundred megabytes of memory, but sometimes, uh, sorry, some of these instances were using gigabytes. So we decided to go investigate to see what was going on. First thing I did, of course, is open up pprof. Now, here is the actual pprof from that issue. There's a lot going on here. It's pretty hard to tell what exactly the issue is. We're able to see roughly what was causing the memory uh, usage to spike. It was a specific type called a frame. A frame is just any time you send a request, we read that into a frame and we forward the frame. Now, a frame is a very generic type. It's the most basic type in this proxy. So knowing that frames are being leaked doesn't really tell us much. We need to know more information, like where, who is still holding on to references to these frames. Unfortunately, there's no easy way to get at that information from the Go runtime right now. So all you can do is use the rest of the information that pprof has kind of available to you to figure out what went wrong. 
And so we tried to do that using this, uh, this page here. But of course, because there's just so much data, it was real, pretty hard to analyze what was going on. Instead, we got this um, flame graph. And with the flame graph, what was useful was we now know proportionally how many objects of each type are being allocated by looking at these leaves. And so one thing I immediately noticed was this object here is called a peer. A peer represents a backend instance. So every time you have a connection to some backend, you have to have a peer object to represent it. I looked at how many connections this instance had, a couple of thousand, and yet somehow we had 95,000 samples of a peer object being referenced. Right? This doesn't make any sense. Why do we have 95,000 peers if we only had 2,000 um, connections? And this helped us eventually trace down the issue. Turns out we were holding on to peer objects, but a peer object is tiny, but a peer object references connections very indirectly. What was happening in this case was that we were trying to maintain a list of connections per peer, and when the, list of connect when the connections are gone, we clear them out. We have a slice with the connections, and every time that connection ends, we remove the connection by moving it to the end of a slice and then truncating the slice. Right? Simple enough. We're now no longer referencing that connection. Our connection list should be zero. And it was zero. The length of all of these slices was zero, yet somehow we were leaking memory. Turns out that because we didn't nil out that last element in the slice, the underlying array still has a valid pointer. So although from my perspective, from the code's perspective, there was a length, sl uh, length zero slice, there was still some data underneath that slice that was pointing to valid memory, and that caused a leak. And we're only able to debug these issues because we're able to like, look at this flame graph and say, oh, these two, these two objects look around roughly the same. Why do we still have peers and connections going on that shouldn't exist? How did these references make it? And we eventually traced it down to this one line. That was all it took. So this is also another good life lesson. If you have pointers in a slice and you're truncating your slice, nil out your slice first. Otherwise, you will leak memory. And that leak won't just be tiny. It can leak gigabytes of memory. So that was another kind of lesson we learned. Um, if you're curious about this issue, uh, when, we, when I eventually send out these slides, you can feel free to look at this issue, which has more information. So let me recap uh, kind of the talk, basically. So PPROF and flame graphs, they're great for profiling, but they're not just for profiling. You can debug a whole bunch of your production issues using flame graphs and PPROF. And typically, when you're dealing with a production issue, you want to figure out the issue as quickly as possible. right? So that's where flame graphs come in, because they help you comprehend the data very easily and very quickly. So we tend to use flame graphs very frequently in our production kind of ecosystem to help service owners debug, their, uh, debug their, any issues they're seeing. One other thing I wanted to cover is that Go 1.9 adds a special fe uh, new feature to PPROF called labels. So you notice that everything I showed was very much dependent upon the code location. Which function are you running? What line of code in that function allocated this information? There's no way to get at that information in any kind of uh, runtime parameterizable way. So for example, maybe you have two different callers. One is a, maybe one's like a bank and really important, and you want to know, oh, like how much memory are we allocating on their request? Because we need those requests to happen as quickly as possible. You can do that now with, uh, with Go 1.9, because the same function can have different labels based on some runtime information, such as a request parameter or a header, whatever it is. You can now add that as a label, and that will let you bucket your data in different ways and cut and slice at it in a way that isn't just your code. It lets you kind of uh, model your runtime shapes as well. So that's all I had. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that if you're interested in profiling and optimization, I wanted to focus on more the production issues that you can debug using flame graphs and PPROF. But if you're more interested in just profiling and optimization, I have given a talk previously on that topic. So feel free to check that out. Um, other than that, that's all I had. So any questions? Anyone? That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Is this on? Any? Yeah, any questions? What do you do in a situation where um, you, you don't have, or like the thing that you're trying to profile uh, takes a long time to run and you can't uh, run it a lot of times? Um, and maybe you have some uncertainty about uh, whether some change you want to make is, is going to uh, 
Sorry, so the question is, um, how do you know like long-term trends of whether something's gotten faster or not because profiling is kind of expensive, basically? Yeah, so typically we don't use profiling to look at long-term, how did this code change? Did it get faster or slower? We tend to look at metrics like latency instead. So if you keep track of your latency over months and months, it's very obvious to see, oh, something changed with this deploy. The, and we don't, don't look at your P50. Your medians are actually not as useful as your P99.9s are. Look at some of the worst latencies you're seeing, not the absolute max, because max is often affected by external factors like CPU scheduling or your OS in general. But like the P99s and the P99.95s, they give you good information about whether your code has actually gotten worse or better in some way. So that's what we tend to use. Any, any more questions? How much overhead does adding uh, labeling from runtime data add to an app? That's a great question. I personally haven't, uh, haven't seen the impact of it yet. I've played with it a little bit. It's actually still a little bit beta. It's, I don't think that the labels are shown in the pprof UI yet. So we, it still hasn't been useful enough for me to kind of add it to production services and get the benefit out of it. It's more of a do, them, do this now because when we eventually have tooling to show you these labels, it'll be useful. But looking at the code, it doesn't seem like a huge overhead. It seems to just associate some label set with your Go routine descriptor. So it doesn't seem particularly bad. Uh, Jana Dogan wrote a blog post on exactly that topic, so you might want to check it out. Any more questions? Are you sure? <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you.